everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. I just realized I did not plug my microphone up, so hopefully you guys can hear me just fine. It's not really going to be a... Well, it's kind of about me today, but it's more about um, some scandalous sides of my family. I'm joined with my good friend, Bobby, who is the crazy grave lady. Uh, how are you doing today, Bobby? I'm doing great, Bryce. How are you doing today? I'm so excited. We've been talking a little bit off camera, and I'm already getting just cracked up of some of these family <laughs> secrets that you've dug up. But before we get into guys, I want you guys to go ahead. If you're not subscribed to Bobby, Bobby has just opened up her channel, Crazy Grave Lady. I'm obviously going to be putting this down in the description box below. Please go and subscribe to Bobby. She is such a great storyteller. And when I first met you, Bobby, and I learned about what you were going to be doing on YouTube, I told our friend Jay, I was like, I'm so jealous. Like, this is such a fabulous idea because you are like the Nancy Drew. You're a Nancy Drew like me. And you want to know who these people are and what their life stories are. And I know you're kind of your tagline is you speak to dead people, but not in the way most people think. And I'll be honest, Bryce, I have more enjoyment learning about dead people than I do learning about people who are alive, like reality stars. I don't care about that. Give me dirt on dead folks. What I'm about. Did they think I feel sorry for our, our ancestors to an extent because they think they went to the grave with their secrets. They mm -hmm. didn't realize we were going to have the internet and have DNA testing and that we were going to be able to dig through all these records. And you are someone you use census records and you're able to dig and find these stories and I had told you, Bobby, so I know, and I think this is true for a lot of people. I think a lot of our friends watching right now, there's always like one side of your family that you probably know a little bit more about than the other side of your family. For me, I grew up knowing a lot about my mom's side of the family. I grew up prim primarily with my mother's side of the family. My mother had three sisters, my mother's parents. My grandmother died at 62. My grandfather died at like 58. So her and her sisters were kind of came together and raised my cousins and my sister and me all too. My cousins on my mom's side of the family are like my siblings. I still have that relationship with them because we were just always together. And, and also because they were from South Carolina and they moved to Georgia. And so there was no lineage in Georgia through my mom's side of the family. So they kind of stuck together with that respect too, that we were actually South Carolinian. We were more Geechee than anything. Well, my dad's side of the family has always been a bit of a, a foggy mystery to me. I know that the Watson family, my dad's father, is from Knoxville, Tennessee. I know that his father was quite a tyrant. I've heard some stories. They were mountain folk. Um, and I, But I did hear things about my grandmother, my dad's mother side of the family. And my, my grandmother, Marianne, who passed away in, I think, 2021, if I remember, she just recently passed away. Um, people always tell me I have her spirit. She was my grandmother who hid books on reincarnation under the bed for my grandfather, even though she played the organ for the church on Sunday. You know, she was very, very supportive of, um, I remember her telling me once when she first got, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and her real personality started coming out as they do with Alzheimer's, that she really wanted to go to a gay bar one day that that was she wanted to be arrested at some point she wanted to know what it was like to be arrested she never got to do those things but but she was very progressive in a lot of ways my, my grandmother and she was a very much a free spirit when i would get back from india she would always pull me in the kitchen and want me to tell her everything that i learned in india she was always always so excited about that non-judgmental of other people's face very different for a southern lady and she would say things to us like the and I, I kind of, Bobby knows, I went back and forth and whether I wanted to say her maiden name or not, because I do know that I have extended, extended, very extended family still in the area. But I'm going to go ahead and just say her maiden name because this is all public record, right? As her last name was Bennett, but it was spelled in the French way. of uh, So Benet would have been the last name. And she would tell me all the time that even though they were Bennett's because we lived in Georgia, they were actually French. That was really important for her to know that her family was French. And we're going to get into that. I want to first, before we get into this, Bobby, I kind of wanted to show a map of, of, oh, and I also knew, which we'll talk about too, that they were all attorneys. That the Bennett family, were they were all attorneys. And my mom's family, they're all doctors. So I thought that was, I, was, I remember as a little kid thinking that was fascinating that they were all attorneys in the, in the, on the Bennett side, except for her father was a dairy farmer, which we'll get into. 
Well, I told Bobby that another reason why I decided to dig deeper into my Marianne's family line, A, she's no longer alive, B, I don't have a relationship with my father, which I know that's strange. Her son, my father, and I do not, um, but I, I have maintained a relationship with my grandparents, even though her son, my father, abandoned us, left. But my grandparents were always there for my sister and me. So it's a very different di dichotomy of a relationship. Well, um, my grandmother, I, I think she must have been in her late 70s, early 80s when, when we had this conversation. I know for a fact that I was home visiting from Los Angeles when I was living in California. So my mid-20s probably, um, I was home visiting, so after college, and I was helping her do the dishes after dinner. And my grandmother had always told us this story because my grandmother was highly, highly, highly educated, which we're going to get into because that's common for this side of the family in a time when women did not receive an education. My grandmother had a master's degree. Um, she, and she always told us growing up that she, her aunts, her father's sisters, never got married. And so she always felt like the reason why they never got married was because Quitman, Georgia was such a small town and they couldn't find husbands. So my grandmother's motivation for going to university was to find a husband. And it wasn't until later in life when I was sitting there washing dishes with her at the kitchen when I was in my mid-20s that she kind of backtracked a little bit. She said, I just realized I don't think my aunts couldn't find husbands because it was a small town. I think they were lesbians. Like all of a sudden, and, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about that because I have a, a suspicion that maybe my great-grandfather was the only child in that family that was probably heterosexual. <laughs> So let me guys quickly show before we get into it, Bobby, I just want to show a map of Quitman, Georgia. It's a tiny, tiny town, you guys. Let me um, blow it up a little bit here. This red little dot. Can you guys see that? That's Quitman. It's right. It's about 15 miles outside of Valdosta, Georgia. Here, this line right here is the Florida line. So they were very close to, to if you can kind of see here, very, very close to Florida. New Orleans is over here. Mobile, Alabama is right here. These are huge French ports. So a lot of times what I'm assuming my grandmother was telling me was that they came up through either New Orleans or Mobile. She said New Orleans and then made their way over into South Georgia where they started to become extremely prominent in this town of Quitman, Georgia. And Bobby, I'm going to hand it over from you let's let's let my family's secrets fly girl let's talk about all the scandals of this scandalous bennett family of equipment south equipment south georgia yes yeah, coming georgia girl okay so let's just take it all the way back to your great grandfather stanley spencer bennett we talked a little bit offline about his father who actually was one of the founding fathers of Quitman and who was actually also the mayor at one time of Quitman. We're not even going to go into him in this show because we probably could do a whole show on Mayor Bill. <laughs> Granddaddy Billy. Granddaddy Bill. Because um, Granddaddy Bill had a very illustrious life, but we're just going to start with Stanley. So this is my um, great, great grandfather. This is your great Great, great granddaddy. Um, I'm just going to call him Stanley because the names are going to get mixed here in a yeah. little bit. Um, again, his father was William Baker Bennett. Um, his mother was Jane, Martha Jane Campbell. Got to put my old lady glasses Holy on. Holy shit, Bobby. <laughs> my great aunt, my my grandmother's sister was named Jane Campbell, uh, Jane Campbell Bennett. That is where that Campbell came from because in the South, we don't give names just for shits and giggles. They all get ready, get ready for names for shits and giggles because it's going to get better. Okay. So, so we'll, hold on. So, William was my grandmother's great grandfather because mm -hmm. Stanley was her. Okay. So, Stanley yeah. was her grandfather. Yes. Stanley's grandparents, sit back. Stanley's grandparents were Matthew Bennett and Sarah Rebecca Spencer. We see, guys, I'm telling you, Bryce is my mother's main name. Mm -hmm. We love this shit in the South. We just mm -hmm. use these names and reuse these names. It gets very confusing. It's like the right. royal family when they all got the same damn name. Keep right. going, Bobby. I'm going to turn my, I'm getting hot listening to this. So I'm going to turn the heater. Just keep going, girl. Keep, I'm I'm gonna, keep listening. You better turn it on because it's going to get hot, girl. I know. Okay. So Stanley was actually born at his father's home. 
I know people are going to like, why are you one born in a hospital? No, because this is now 1867 and yeah. that is very common. Um, I, I slept in the bed in that my grandmother was born in, in Quitman. Not there the mattress, go. but the bed frame. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I think it was a typo when they said that he graduated from Macon University. I think he actually graduated from Mercer University. Um, and he graduated in 1888. And he was admitted to the bar in 1896. So we're talking Stanley? not. Yes. Stanley. Okay. Yeah. So like this is like still father. early, you know, 1800s. Now, Stanley also was mayor in addition to his father. So we're looking at two generations of mayor. So Papa Bill, who was one of the founders, was also mayor. And his son was. And like son was. Family as well okay um now again his father we, we've talked about um so he stanley was a baptist his father was one of the founders of the baptist church in Quitman. it was the the church was founded by his father his mother and his two slaves Um, told you should have turned that air conditioning up because it's going to get a little juicy. Um, now, what's interesting is that Stanley was actually a member of the General Assembly. He was a member of both branches of General Assembly. Oh. Yeah, so he's prominent. Um, he was also a worship worshipful master of the Sholto Ma Masonic Lodge. Yep, he was a high up, high up Freemason, wasn't he? He sure was. Yep. Um, now, yeah. Here's where it gets good. And this is where people, people in Quitman actually really respected him because he did a lot for the town. He helped get the bond on the election or get the bond on the election on the docket that established the first electrical lighting system in Quitman. Oh, so he because apparently it, they had been trying to get the system of lighting upgraded for like 10 or 15 years. People had been pushing it off. Um, Mayor Stanley gets on the board and he's like, no, we need to get this through because the lighting's terrible. Because I guess they had those um, those gas lights that just kind of fizzed out at that point. And he said, no, we need to get this rolling. And so he got it on the election and made that happen. He said, let there be light. And there was light. Yeah. Well, it's a big farming community. So that yeah. makes sense that they would need, um, when once electricity came around, more access to artificial light for... The community to thrive yeah he was also a state senator from 1905 to 1907 i did not know that yeah yeah so i've got a few senators in my family then that's interesting you do Both sides. Now his, his wife his wife is one of my favorites they, I, I got some, i'm partial to a few people in your family bryce i'm sorry but his wife minnie is one of my favorites minnie minnie, was parks, nice. minnie. minnie, minnie parks minnie. high tower Okay, so her dad, James, was the was the town coroner. Is this where I get my love for like probably Mormon things? I'm a cop. Your Mormon fascination comes from great 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 grandpappy James because that's right. And Hightower, when you said that, I kind of got a little shocked because Hightower is a huge name here in Georgia. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of Hightower built, mm -hmm. and then I'm like. Yes, they were a prominent family. The Bennetts was were also a prominent family, so those two families together. merged. Now she was um, she lived from December eighteen sixty nine from to December nineteen fifty one. Um, she was a charter member of the Quitman chapter of the Daughters of the Confederacy. Um, I was also really impressed with her um, because she was educated. Um, she was she got a college education and she was assistant to the headmaster at Quitman Academy from 1888 to 1889. So this is my great great grandmother, Stanley's wife. Stanley's wife. So my grandmother's grandmother. Right. And something that we've discussed in the past, and I know you've discussed on your channel, is that women were not educated mm -hmm. in those days. So the fact that in 1869 when she was born that not only did she go to high high school 
whatever yeah. they called it then, and then went to college. And then she was an assistant to the headmaster. So she helped educate people. That says something for and her. This is before women even had the right to vote. Right. And I will say it is common for women back then of highbrow or high society, which I guess we can, it's safe to say that my grandmother's family was aristocratic gentry of the South. Women typically went to what they called etiquette schools mm -hmm. after a certain age. As long as they knew how to read and write, then they would go off and learn how to like be hostesses at parties. So to go and actually do academic stuff was very unheard of. Let alone to help someone educate people Other and women. to be a female. Yeah. Now, as you got further along, you had the headmistress and we'll talk about your family and how they did that. But mostly educators were male. Yeah. So to have a woman be an assistant educator in what was considered it was the Equipment Academy, which was the biggest place to learn at the time, that's a big deal. Now, we won't talk about the fact that Equipment Academy was founded by big, great, 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 Bill. We won't talk about that. Oh, was I? Some nepotism there. We won't talk about the nepotism. Give my daughter-in-law a job. Give her a job. But she wasn't married to him at the time. She oh. was still a high tower. So it maybe really that's was. how she met Stanley. Right? It could have been. It could have been. I'm glad she did. Because I'm did, glad she did I, too. I, I and that might have been why she was only um uh, the assistant for a year. Maybe she went off and got married or met him at that point. I mean, well, no, 1888 to 89. She married him in 1992. So she might have met him because of that. And then a few years later, they got married. Interesting. Yeah, because they got married in 1892. So the Bennett family and I guess the Hightower family kind of have a reputation for allowing women they were kind of progressive when it came to mm -hmm. giving their daughters educations. Because I've yeah. just seen my great, great, great grandfather, James Hightower, my grandmother's great grandfather on her, her mm -hmm. the, the coroner. Yeah, the coroner. He was the one that had to support his daughter at that, at that age, especially to go into higher education. Mm -hmm. So the Hightower family most likely was also very prominent when it came to, or very progressive when it came to making sure their daughters were just as educated as their sons. Again, at yeah. a time when women didn't even vote, weren't even allowed to vote. Yeah, because they couldn't vote till early 1900s. Right. Yeah. Wow. So that was a big deal. Wow. Okay, so Minnie and Stanley had five kids. Five? Five. Wow, I only thought there were four, so... Nope. There's a little one that you probably don't realize. The first, the one that you probably don't realize is Marion. Marion Sims Bennett. Um, Cause Marion died at three. She, uh, she lived from 1894 to 1897. I could not find a cause of death. I couldn't find a newspaper article. I couldn't find a death certificate. It could have been anything in those it days. Sickness. It could have been anything. Been a snake bite. It could have been. Cholera. Cholera yeah. was big then. Measles was big yeah. then. And they might not have publicized it because they were a well-to-do family. Right. Especially if they had doctors in the family and they can't cure it. Well, it was my mom's family. Who, I don't know if the Bennett's had doctors. It was my mom's That's family who doctors. So, but you know, the lawyers and the doctors, they probably could afford the best of medical care. And so. If they've got family connections to the coroner, they might not have put that death certificate out. That's heartbreaking because I had no idea. I'd never heard of Marion before. Mm -hmm. I wonder if my, because I'd never heard my aunt when I, my father was in my life. I never heard him refer to. Interesting. I wonder mm -hmm. if they even know. I'll send, I'll send my aunts this video. This is interesting. Yeah. Now, do you want to talk about the aunts, the lesbian aunts? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I met my aunts, my dad's sisters, but yeah, we can talk about. Okay. So <laughs> the kids I know that I, so my grandfather was Paul. Okay. My, Paul. Mm -hmm. And I know that there was a Spencer um, mm -hmm. because my dad actually drove a, they called him Spence, Uncle mm -hmm. Spence. My dad actually drove his scout. He had a blue scout. And when um, when my great grandfather died away, I think he died in 1986. because I was I, I have one memory of Paul, one memory. Um, 
and my dad got Spence's Scout. And the people that grew up with me remember my dad probably have memories of my dad driving this blue Scout everywhere. He loved the Scout, which his uncle Spence's, his great uncle Spence's Scout. And there was Millie. I remember great aunt Millie because Millie married a very wealthy man up here in Atlanta from Buckhead. And Buckhead's the Beverly Hills of Atlanta. And I remember she she lived a long ass time. I think I was like 14 when she died. And I remember going with my grandmother to Millie's house in Buckhead. And I always really liked Millie. She was real tall, real tall lady. Mm-hmm. And then there was another aunt I never knew named Louise, I believe. And I remember Louise taught my grandmother because they were big pianist. And Louise, my grandmother used to tell me, because my grandmother was a pianist, she used to tell me all the time that when her aunt would teach her piano, she hated her Aunt Louise. She would put quarters on her knuckles. And if the quarters fell off her knuckles while she was playing, she would get whacked for not having proper posture. Because if you have proper posture while you play piano, the quarters won't fall off. So anyway, so that's, I know of Paul. Obviously, Paul is my great-great-great-grandfather. I know of Spence, Louise, and Millie. Those are the four I know. So let's talk about Millie for a second. Okay. Mildred. Okay. All right. <laughs> Mildred. Mildred, but we'll call her Millie because, you know, you've got a good relationship with her. Yeah. Uh, so Millie lived from October 1905 to June of 1996. So you're right. She lived a very long, 91. She made it to 91. Um, so ni- the 1940 census listed her as a teacher at a business school. Um, but here, and here's where we talk about the rich man that she married. She had to have married sometime after 1950. So we talked. She was born in 1905, but she married sometime after 1950. So she was older there, older when she got married. He was a widower, widower with children whose first wife died in a car accident. How did she meet him? I don't know. I don't know. I can't find that. But... They, the, she, the children were mentioned in the obituary. So she had to have had a good relationship with them. And she was mentioned in the obituary of one of the other children as the stepmom. So she had to have had, like I said, a good relationship with the kids and she took those kids in. So he, and this happened very frequently in those people will take on a second wife as a caretaker yeah and she benefited financially well i mean i think she probably inherited a lot of money but yeah. she so benefited i remember the house i mean i think i told you some stories i actually remember going to her house i thought she was so fun and just she was old but she was fun but i kind of remember my grand because i guess it was and i was so young i didn't think about it this way because i saw my grandmother's also being old but it was my grandmother's aunt like that was her mm-hmm. her authority like one of her you know and i kind of remember my grandmother being a little bit more reserved around Millie now looking back it's like well that was her aunt so you know but yeah and I and she I remember when she died I remember um she was bare there her service was at the Episcopalian church actually just around the street here on Ponce de Leon in Atlanta and we're not Episcopalian we were Presbyterian and my grandfather my dad's dad did not know when to kneel and when not to kneel and he got caught mid kneel up front at that funeral and kind of just hovered and you can see sweat just coming down his face because he was six foot five, probably close to 300 pounds so at that point. So, you know, um, but yeah, I, I, Millie and Paul were the only two that I have any, I have more memories of Millie than Paul because she obviously lived longer than her brother did. So, and she lived closer to us in Atlanta. But yeah, that was common, wasn't it? They would take on, and, and now I'm wondering if, if her, do you know, who was her husband? Did you see his last name? His last name was Barnes. Barnes. I'm wondering if the husband just knew of the Bennett family through connections, through highbrow connections. And I don't know. That's a, that's a, a good guess. Actually his Walter Barnes was his name. Barnes. Yeah. So she was Millie Barnes on at mm-hmm. her death. Yeah. And she's buried in Quitman, right? Not mm-hmm. Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the family's buried in Quitman. Yeah. Once you come to Quitman, you stay in Quitman apparently. <laughs> They're like, we're royalty down here. <laughs> like, don't you know who I am? I'm a Bennett. Come on, man. I'm a Bennett. I'm a prince of equipment. I'm a princess of equipment. I'm a founding father. Come on. I gave you light. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Like, uh, 
I so, will, I'll tell you a funny story, though, about that, too. Remember when we were kids, Bobby? I know kids today, they play on their tablets and iPads when they're eating. But remember, we had to read the back of cereal boxes, like when we were kids. Mm -hmm. That was our entertainment while because we didn't have internet. Well, I was at my grandmother's house, and my grandmother and my grandfather, we never we'd spend the night with them. They'd always let us have either Frosted Flakes cheery, uh, uh, cereal, or my grandfather would make pancakes. So we always got to eat, like, food we didn't get to eat at my mom, my mom and dad's house. And it was on the back of a Frosted Flakes box. It was all these weird questions, and it was like, where in the world is there a law that states the chicken cannot cross the road? And my grandmother knew it because it was Quitman, Georgia, because it was because of her, her, her house, her farm. Her, the chickens would get out and cross the road all the time. And so the equipment made a law that chickens can't cross the road because Paul Bennett's chickens would get out all the time. I got small. My grandma was like, ooh, 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 that's equipment. That's equipment. <laughs> so for a long time, I thought that's what my Bennett family was famous for, for having some rogue chickens. <laughs> random chicken law. It's a random chicken law. A rogue chicken that still exists today. That's still a law in equipment today. You know, these old laws. And I, and I had heard them. I didn't realize that they were just as so just, they were like, they like owned equipment. Like they were equipment. Yeah. Yeah. And they all went back and got buried there. Well, most of them. Most of them went back not. and got buried there. My grandmother's yeah. not buried there, but, but she's, she's buried up in North Georgia with my grandfather. But yeah. Yeah. Wow. Now, now Louise, the other sister. Louise might have been the mean one, but Louise is still one of my favorites. I'm sorry. <laughs> because Louise led a very colorful life. And so I'm very impressed with Louise. And I found out some stuff about Louise that you might not know. So, okay. okay. So, of course, we know that Louise never got married, mm -hmm. which is where we question Her sexual. Louise's she was a sexual sister. preference. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, and Louise also very tall, mm -hmm. very tall from pictures that we've talked about with louise she was the secretary of the chamber of commerce which as a woman i was very surprised by this yeah this is still a time this early 1900s right this is a time yeah when we're just yeah housewives. right and she was one of the like one of the first members of the chamber of commerce of equipment too which really surprised me as well that they actually let a woman be in the chamber of commerce let alone be the secretary um the 1930 census listed her as a field secretary for college and 1950 listed her as a music teacher. This is also what was listed on her passport. Um, she worked for Shorter College, which goes back to That's where the my grandmother went thing. to college. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, college. Now you talked about the piano. She did teach piano lessons and it was at what they called the big house which was the house which was next to the law office which is where stanley lived so they had the big house and then the law office was the little house that was next door and that's where the law practice was so she was in the big house and then the law office was next to it we now, want me to come back to that house at the end bobby because i have information on that house now too <laughs> i bet you do uh, <laughs> now here's the part that I don't think you know, but this is where it comes full circle, Bryce. Um, prior to 1919 in Quitman, there really wasn't a health department or a health service or anything like that. She was actually the county health nurse. So she was a nurse too. Mm -hmm. And she was sponsored by the Red Cross and she mostly went to schools and homes. Uh -huh. That's fascinating. So I, in my, my mind, I go back and forth between like deep state and like, that's cool. Mm -hmm. you know, it's in the shady side of your, of my family, like the masonry, Red Cross. But then also, we also know that a lot of times people just do things because they think it's the better betterment for society. So you want to believe that that's mm -hmm. really, that's, that's interesting. Right. And then you think about it, though, back in those times, nurses weren't really an official position, though. My great grandmother was also a nurse and they trained you to do basically home medicine and you went around and you treated people. She was but a witch. No, <laughs> she was a witch. Yeah, she's a witch um, for all intents and purposes. Um, but that's what she did is if somebody was sick, she went over and she treated them. She got and a looks like she had. 
funding from the American Red Cross. But that's what brings me to the passport, which is what I thought was interesting because it said that she went on a trip in 19, I think it was 16 or 18 to France. How old was she at this point? Let's see. She would have been 1893. She had about 20, so give or take. Woman, young woman going to on a boat, probably. Right. And at least I can verify that her sister went with her. Millie went with her. Mm -hmm. And that they went to France. And from what it sounds like, they went to like a medical hut type place. So it looks to me like it was kind of like a missionary type thing. Like they went to do like a medical trip. So I don't know if it was church related, if it was medical related, but they went overseas. And if, if you're looking at the timeline, it was right around the time of World War I. So it was either the end of World War I or like right in those dates. Wow, that's around the time that Matahari was executed. I'll put it that. It sure was. Guys, when uh, when if you're new to the channel, I'll put that interesting story down. That gives me chill bumps, Bobby, because I, I, I did I say this already on the show? I know I said it to you, Mike. And, and I guess for people who are not from the United States, this might be a part of sub American culture you might not be familiar with. But I, I've said this before: different pockets of the United States are typically set, were settled by different. Like in the Southeast, you have a lot of people of English descent, a lot. Northeast, you got a lot of Italian, Irish, that kind of stuff. Um. And my grandmother found it very important for us to know, especially towards the end, that her family was French. Like I said, I think I said that in the beginning, that her family, she was really important for her to, for us to understand that her family was French. And I don't know if it's because we're so inundated with English culture down here in the South that at the end she wanted, but you would think about if so if Millie and Louise were got on a boat and went to France after World War I to do whatever they needed to do medically, I would assume they probably spoke fluent French. Yeah. The destination on the passport, um, I looked at the passport record again. The destination of their trip was listed as hospital hut services. So, it, like I said, it's either missionary or medical related. And, yeah. Why would they, why would two young girls go to a country that they didn't have lineage in? Speaking, they, they obviously spoke mm -hmm. fluent French. Yeah. And it makes sense because they were Baptist, um, you know, in New Orleans, Mobile, Alabama area that was settled by the uh, French originally. And then it went back and forth between the Spanish and the French. Um, for those who are not familiar with American hi history, Louisiana didn't become a part of the United States until the Louisiana Purchase, which was the early 1800s. And so New Orleans, that area, that was a very predominantly Catholic post. So if you're a an, an Huguenot immigrant coming through New Orleans, you're going to try to get out of that area as quickly as possible, getting into the English, the more English settlements because of religious persecution um, in that time. So that would make sense that, that they, you know, it's so funny when, when how would, I would laugh and say this because my grandmother was a little bit witchy. I always laugh. She's a little witchy because she had books on reincarnation and she was, t she would totally be down for like tarot cards and that kind of stuff. She would, if she, you know, have her crystals, if she wanted, if she, you know, she knew about them at that time. Um, so I always laugh that she's a little witchy. And then when she was getting close to the end there, she kept telling us, like, we came up through New Orleans. I would be like, Grandma, are you really trying to tell us we were a witch? Like, are you really trying to tell us some families? But yeah, I, I, that it's just crazy that that didn't really come up until later in life where she felt it was really important for us to understand that her family was French. Mm -hmm. And she would say, look at the way the name is spelled. That's not the English way of spelling. Bennett, it's Benet. But we live in an English, I mean, Bryce, my mother's main name with an I is Brice. It's French too. But they've been in America since the 1600s in an English settlement. So it over time evolved into the English pronunciation, which is Bryce. That's fascinating. God, I wish I wish I could conjure the dead and just ta ask them, like, what was going on? Like, did they witness Matahari's execution? <laughs> right? Did right? you go to burlesque shows? Like, what were you doing over there? <laughs> Okay, so my favorite part, and this is why I think maybe I'm endeared to her. She was also president of the Women's Club from 1917 to 1918. And the Women's Club, they were actually big on cemetery beautification. So thank you, Louise, for 
for helping with the cemetery beautification. This is why I got my grandma. My mama used my mother. My mother used to say that to me. You got Marianne's spirit. Like there's a lot of Bennett. In, you might look a lot like the Bryce family, but you got a lot of Bennett in you. Now I can make name play my macabre, my macabre fascination on the side of the family. So I love me some Louise. Thank you, Louise, for cleaning up the cemetery for me. That is hysterical. She loved her dead people, didn't she? Yes, she did. She was probably in there doing some seances. This was like spiritualism as well. This is when spiritualism was big. She was probably in there doing some seances. And Piano playing by day, cemetery cleaning by night. That's my girl. That's yep. my girl. She's yep. no more different than I am, honestly. <laughs> That is awesome. Well, they were they were suffragettes too, weren't they, mm -hmm. Millie? So, um, yeah. Bobby, do you want to explain to our viewers who who um, are not from the United States, perhaps, or not or too young to understand? Well, what was a suffragette? What what were they? Okay, so until the I'm going to say probably like early 20s, I think women couldn't vote. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we take it for granted now because we think people can vote. But women especially could not vote. And there was a big movement um, to allow women the right to vote. And women who were key to this movement were called suffragettes. And they did this push, let's give everyone the right to vote. Um, so the suffragettes did this push. They and then in the did, they marched. Yeah. Um, they were big for equal rights just in general too. If, if, if anybody remembers Mary Poppins. Mm -hmm. Mary Poppins, yeah. the mother was a suffragette over it. She had her, her banister on and she would mark in their dresses. They, they did the song. I think it was the suffering suffragettes. Yes. The song. And, so, and I remember my grandmother telling me that her aunts were suffragettes, that they fought hard to get women the right to vote. I guess that's what happens when you educate women, Bobby. <laughs> they start getting this cra these crazy ideas. These crazy ideas. They want to do things and stuff. I mean, come on. They want to, and, and you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the case I covered with Angie, the uh, Mahaley Lancaster case. Yes, yes. And I said Mahaley Lancaster, I'll, I'll pin that down below too, guys, if you're new to the channel. My grand, she reminded me, Mahaley Lancaster reminded me so much of my grandmother's family from what I knew, because she, she was a suffragette. She was a very prominent woman, and she was also a, 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 a psychic medium, you know, oracle. Um, so yeah, yeah. Now the brothers, Spencer and Paul. I forgot about this, them. <laughs> yeah, I know. I forgot about them too. And this is where history starts to get shady because oh, there's really? not as much about them as there are about everybody else. So it's where I know, I know. And you'd think there's more about Spencer than there is about Paul. And I think and it makes me wonder if it's because Paul just led a nice, quiet life. Yes. Or, or he had something to hide. But I think it's that he led more of a quiet life. I think maybe he just wanted to be away from the spotlight of everybody else. So cause I, Paul is my, that's my line is Paul. Right. So this is what I know about Paul. So my grand, that's my great grandfather. That is my grandmother's father. Mm -hmm. And Paul so my dad, before when my dad, before my dad left, I, he would tell me stories. My father would go and spend the summers on Paul's dairy farm, and he learned like my grandfather Paul, his whole family were attorneys and lawyers, and Paul just wanted to be a dairy farmer, and so he was a dairy farmer, and he had, I think it was the Bennett, the Bo Ben or Ben Bo, it was named after Bennett, the Bennett, mm -hmm. and then my great grandmother who was a Bowden, which is also a French name. Um, my sister's named after her, Mary Rebecca. They call her Maybeck. Uh, my sister goes by Mary Becca. Um, but Maybeck, my great grandmother, I think she died in like the 60s. So I never knew her at all. But um, they had their dairy farm. And he, my dad would go and spend the summers down with his grandfather on the dairy farm. And he, were, he would tell me stories about how every month when the bills were due to be paid, my grandfather always taught my dad, now it's so different now, that he would, it was important to him to go into every single business, look the business owner in the eye, and pay them the bill in person. That was really important to Paul. And so my, my dad remembered going with him that month when that month 
Bill was due, driving around town and going into ed every single business and personally looking them in the eye and thanking them and paying the bill in person. I don't know what he would do today if he saw how we do it online. You know, oh, we have gosh. no human interaction. And of course, he had his rogue chickens that would cross the road a lot. And what I remember now, guys, keep in mind, he died in 1986. Mm -hmm. I was born in 1983. So I have a memory one memory of him in his house and that house they lived in uh, that my grandmother grew up in always scared me as a child. I always thought it was haunted. It probably was, which we'll get to that because apparently I've got some hauntings with this family equipment as well that I've discovered. But I remember being a little kid and like being a kind of afraid of, of, of that house. It was beautiful. And I remember Paul, the one memory I have of Paul of him sitting in like a lazy boy recliner and I guess he was like, it, it was probably right before he died because I, it's a, a very, it's one of my first memories. So it was probably right before he died. And he was just kind of sitting there in the, in, the, in the lazy boy. And I remember playing on the stairs though of that house. It was an old like plantation style house with my dad's cousin. So my first cousin once removed, my grandmother's sister, Jane Campbell, my mm -hmm. great aunt and her, and her son and her youngest son. Um, was between my, he was a lot, lot younger than my dad. So he was, he was closer to my age than my dad's age. And his name, we, they, he, he went by Corbett back then, but now he goes by Paul. He was Paul Corbett. He was named after Paul, but now he goes by Paul. And so I remember playing on the stairs with Corbett and I, cause I called him Corbett back then. And we, you know, we little, little, listen guys, if you're young watching this, we didn't have tablets, phones, anything like that. We had fun just bopping our butts up and down stairs when we were really little. And I remember playing with him while the adults were in the front room talking. And I don't, Again, I don't know if that memory is associated with the same time I saw Paul or if it was after he died. So they were discussing funeral arrangements. I don't know. But I do know that my grandfather also had, he loved his cows. That I heard my whole life growing up, that Paul, Granddaddy Paul, loved his cows. Like his dairy farm was not run like dairy farms today. They were milked by hand. He took care of his cows. They were his, actually, they had a house in Florida, but they, it was only a few hours away because they were pretty close to the Gulf and out on Alligator Point. And the house was called the Cow Palace. That's how much he loved his cows. And I think he was probably a lot, a lot of, my father's a veterinarian, a large animal veterinarian. And if I had to guess, I would probably say my father got that inspiration to be an, a big, a large animal vet because of Paul. Because large animals handle, they handle horses, cows, dogs, cats. You know, and he, my father has to go out to farms to see horses and cows like that. He has to actually still go out there. And that's probably where he got that inspiration was my grand, my great grandfather's love of cows. Well, my grandfather, when he died, he had two cows because so, my sister, I think my sister had just been born because she was born at the end of 86. He had two cows that he named after his great grandchildren. So there is a cow out there named Bryce. And there's a cow out there named Mary Becca. Now, obviously, Mary Becca was his, it probably touched him that she was named after his late wife. But so, yeah, he he loved his cows. And my Aunt Elizabeth, my dad's youngest sister, she has some hysterical stories to tell you about being on that dairy farm and being chased by bulls. Because um, they would just get, that's what you did back then, right? You didn't have helicopter parenting. Uh -uh. You just went and, and if you got hit by, knocked out by a bull, well, you learned a lesson, didn't you? Don't, don't mess with the bull. So she has a story, hysterical, but I, that house, what I remember, and then my memory could be fading, uh, hazy, because again, this, I'm, I'm almost 41. And this happened when I, I, the last, I was three or four when the last time I went, you had to go down a driveway and it was, oh, the house was kind of covered by big trees with Spanish moss. So it's what like you, so when you say he kind of wanted to live a quiet life, that rings, that resonates. Mm -hmm. That the house was kind of hidden away by Spanish moss. Obviously, the chickens knew the escape route, and they were quite a problem. He had two daughters. He had my grandmother first, my grandmother Marianne, and then my great aunt Jane. So he had two little girls. He was the only one out of all the children to have children, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Now yeah. there are two things that I did find out about him. Um, he was president of the Rotary, um, and he he like his brother Spence were also president at one time of the country club, which oh. you've talked about. Now, I want I, I would like to touch a little bit on the country club just for a second. Oh, man. <laughs> because the Quitman Country Club, I, I, I found this little tidbit about the Quitman Country Club that I thought you would be amused by, and I just wanted to share it for a second. Um, 
when the Quitman Country Club was established, there was a certain bylaw put in place um, that no member, this I, I'm quoting, no member or invited guest shall dance what is known as the shimmy, cheek, camel walk, or any dance of similar character, and also no alcohol was allowed on the premises. Bryce, you would have been in trouble. I would, well, that's wild because Southerners love you. My grandmother, my grandmother was Roseanne all day before Roseanne all day was a thing. I learned about the pink wine from my grandmother. You could not have been do doing that back when the country club was established. You can't twerk. Telling you. you can't twerk. You can't now, girl. <laughs> I'm wondering if either Paul or Spence changed that rule because back when it was established, you could not do that. It, cause, you know, well, that makes sense because that, that was a very musical family. I mean, they were all piano players. My grandmother was an incredible singer. She could harmonize. My grandmother, my sister and I took piano lessons all from the time we were like in first grade all the way till the time we left high school. So over a decade weekly, yes, guys, I can play the piano. We had to because of my, it was, it was compulsory. Like it was mandatory. My cousins did as well. I actually have a male cousin, my man, Elizabeth's son, who's an incredible pianist now. So that family was, you would think that a family that's really into music would also want dancing and that kind of stuff as well and it's funny you talk about the no alcohol rule too i mean my grandmother i learned what pink wine was rosé from my grandmother and i also learned about box wine from my grandmother as wealthy as they were she always had boxed wine it's usually the wealthy ones that do have box wine isn't it i mean she always had, i didn't know that that was not classy until like i was in college i was like my grandma always had box wine like <laughs> she always had <laughs> Wow. So you think I could pitch up at the Equipment Country Club today and just be like, I've arrived? And I'm here to camel walk. Watch out. <laughs> With my PBR, my rosé. I was also interested because, and we'll talk just, as, we'll touch on Spence. Um, Spence's wife was also part of the beautification committee for the country club. So she was a big fundraiser for the country club. That's what rich women did. That's uh -huh. a very yeah. common job for rich ladies. And Spence was an attorney. Didn't he follow in his father's footstep? He Spence was an attorney. He was also a big military guy. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, he so, was He was big in the military. Um, and I don't know if it was like formal military or if it was... Because I know he was he was enlisted in World War One, or if he just kind of like stayed on... Yeah, because most of them. Paul was enlisted. Spence was enlisted. And of course, his dad, but I mean, they don't really serve at that point because they're old. But yeah. but it, he, I don't know if his like, and I don't know if they called it ROTC, but like junior, whatever it was back then. And if he kind of stayed involved and then he did law because he didn't get married until he was 38. Yeah, I have some speculations about Spence too. I know you do. And I kind of have them too, because he married, well, his wife was 24. He was 38. She was she owned a beauty shop. And they had no and you don't hear any more about them. But then the obituary lists his nieces. No children. My grandmother? And yeah, okay. So I think Spence died in like 1980, right? Like right before I was born. 1980, yep. He, so, was, he lived eight, 1897 to 1980. So, and I know that that was a big thing about, because my mom's family, side of the family, everyone dies young. Everyone dies young. They're all, that's the joke. Like the doctor's kids are always the sickest. Everyone dies young. My dad's family, those people, they just live and live and live and live. So I'm hoping I have the longevity of that, of that side of the family. But um, Spence, so I know Spence and Paul were close as brothers. I mean, and Quinn was a small town too. So who else you can play with as a kid, but your siblings. Um, and that's why my grand, my, that's why my dad, my dad had a lot of really nice things to say about his great uncle Spence. They had no children. Which is kind of strange too for a married couple in Quitman or in, in a highbrow society at that time. To you're almost expected to have children, and it wasn't like they got married when she was of an like he was older, right. but ish, she was fertile, but she wasn't. No, unless there were fertility problems that right. no one spoke about. I, you know, I um, you sent me, and I will say I was quite shy. I remember pictures of well, now when I the memory I have of Paul, he was old and fat. Right. But like I've seen pictures of Paul when he was younger, just like in my grandmother's house. And I was like, oh, he was, he was really good. You know, there's a joke about that. There's a community that talks about that when you're going through all pictures and you see a picture of granddad. And you're like, 
Great, that was kind of hot. Well, I've seen that with Paul. Paul was really good looking. And then I found a picture of Spencer. You spent a, a picture of Spencer. He was very attractive, very good looking man. He was way better looking than his sisters. Which, and that's why I'm like, why did he wait till 38 to get married? He is in a, now I met my husband and I got married when we were older too. And my husband was first marriage for him as well. But that's because now in society, <laughs> it's, it's not, it's, look, it's looked at differently. Yeah. Back in 18, like in or early 1900s, you got married. Yeah, 24 was old to get married. 24 like, was old. He's yeah. 38. And this is his first marriage. This is not his second marriage. This is his first marriage. So what was he doing? a man that's looked yeah. at weird. Or a man that's very prominent, that comes from a very powerful family, a very wealthy man. And, and I'm like, was he out just fucking around with other guys? I don't know. You know, like, I have no idea. Um, I'm just speculating. because, And that's the thing. You're right, Bobby. If this was the story in 2024, I wouldn't speculate about the sexuality. But because this happened at a time when that was strange, I speculate. Because he was an eligible. Like, if you were a young lady in Quitman, Georgia, Spencer Bennett was like the catch. Because he came right. from a really good family. You're not. He was hot. You were set. Like if you married him, you were you weren't gonna have to worry about anything because that was a very prominent, wealthy family that had a lot of rank and pull with the law of equipment. Like you were gonna be fine. And then to not have children, I find that strange. That my grandfather Paul was my great was the only one to have kids out of that whole litter of, of children mm -hmm. now with millie and louise yeah women didn't have as much pull back then so you could say rather unfortunate they died spencers or at least louise died of spencer but i actually do think they i mean my grandmother even said that she was like i think they were when she was uh, later in life she's like i think they were lesbians <laughs> but the fact that well i mean and, and marriage was so important the fact that my grandmother as a little girl was very concerned about the fact that her aunts were not married she was very concerned about that and she really thought it was because the town was so small and they just couldn't find husbands. And that was her goal for going to, to university was because she wanted to find a husband. She didn't want to end up like Millie and Louise. Women in college in when I went to college in the South. So they still were there for the MRS degree. Yeah, that's very common. Very common. I mean, it's yeah, it hasn't changed when they and I mean, I knew people that were like, well, I'm really here for such and such degree. But if I meet a man, I'll probably quit. And I'm like, what? Why are you going to waste your and I mean, maybe that was my mindset. But I'm like, there are still people that were of that thought. Yeah. And there were people that would say to me, well, what family are you from? Yeah. Are they, are they of the such and such of Mississippi? And I'm like, no. Yeah. I'm from the such and such family. I'm like, they're not from anything. It's like, because they still hold that regard, even in this age. Oh yeah. Of that old Southern tradition. And seeing, these are the yeah. things that you have to follow. And it's, it hasn't changed in all of these hundreds of years. No, I'm, I, I laugh about it, but I'm sure now if I were to go to equipment, which I am planning, guys, I drive by equipment all the time when I go to Florida. I just never pull off because Make sure you put the I'm Quitman Royalty. I'm I gave you a white bumper I'm, sticker on your I'm, car. I'm a, okay. I'm a default of Bennett through my grandmama. Um, but no, I, I'm sure if I went and knocked on the door of the Chamber of Commerce and said, I'm Paul Bennett's great granddaughter, they would probably they would probably be like, oh, come in. Let's, you know, they would they would still, because that's how it is in the South. I mean, that's why I've told the story with my mom's family with the name Bryce. Um, the Williams Bryce, Williams Bryce can't speak stadium at the University of South Carolina. When I was uh, applying to university and, and, and my school, um, I was basically told by my college advisor at a private school, preparatory school, if you want to go to the University of South Carolina, you don't need to do anything. We just call them up because of your name. And, I, the, and none of us, my, not myself, not my cousins, not, not my mom, not her sisters, went to University of South Carolina. For me, that would have been mortifying. I would have been embarrassed by that because my name is Bryce. And, and being from the South, everybody would have known, all the kids who are from the South would have known that that's fun. They, that's very common in the South to, to use reuse names and family names. I mean, no one in my family has a name that's not a family name. We all have family names. Um, in fact, my mother wanted to name me Laura after the character in Dr. Zhivago. And my grandmother was like, absolutely not. You're not doing that. You're giving her a family name. So um, so that's that's very important. So yes, when you are in the gentry, the aristocratic gentry of the South, 
you're kind of in a lot of ways born into a prison because people watch you. They know more about your family than you know about your family. You have to mind you. When I got my tattoo, it was like mortifying for my family because that's, you know, we still do debutantes. You know, I don't think I was ever expected to work, even though I was expected to go to university because I was expected to marry another man of the same gentry that would then continue to provide. And I would just be the perfect little housewife that hosted parties. You know, the fact that I live with a man now and I'm almost 41 and don't have kids back then I would have been labeled as something strange. Right. But that's just it's such a different it's such a different world we live in now. But, yeah, those still those 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 little cultural so there's just there's just deep cultural there's a book that somebody wrote. i can't remember the name of the book i remember reading the book it's about charleston south carolina and i don't remember the, the writer explaining to the aristocrats of charleston south carolina being like a shadow that creeps behind you watching always and i thought that was such an incredible way to describe like the gentry of the south it's this shadow so even though you think these people are born to privilege and opportunity in which they are i'm not going to deny it there are privilege and opportunity there's also a lot of pressure what would happen if Spence had been caught with a man? Oh, he would have not been only disowned by his family. He would have been disowned by the town. Yep. Probably by the county. The family. Maybe by the state. Have, the, the, the family would also have probably tried to pay off the man to keep him quiet. Mm hmm. Because they had the money for it. Yeah. Because you think if you're thinking about great, great grandpappy Bill. Yeah. Who's the state senator. They don't want that out there. No. And I mean, you've got. Spence, the, the gay man, and we've got possibly two sisters who were lesbians. We yeah. don't want that out. No. So maybe they let Paul just live a quiet life because of, with his chickens and his cows because they're like, at least he procreated. They're like, well, you know, I know you want to be a farmer, and that's really not what we want you to be, but, you know, at least you're not gay. At least, at least you and that's the lesser of two evils at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Because that was always an, an anomaly that in my my... It's funny, I was telling you before we signed on, my great aunt Jane, who I knew, my, my grandmother's sister, she's no longer she's no longer living, uh, my cousin Corbett's mother, um, Jane Campbell, uh, now I know where Campbell comes from, um, she, uh, she married a, a Georgia Superior Court judge, my great uncle, Mac. That was her one marriage from, and he ended up becoming a big judge, which was always nice. I remember that when I lived in LA, having conversations, like knowing that I have somebody that high up and like our, even in California, knowing I have an uncle who's a superior court judge of Georgia made me feel more comfortable because I felt like I had somebody in the wings that could help if, if, if there was any a situation that I needed help in, you know? Um, I mean, so that, so she even continued to marry my great aunt, even married into the same, the same type of family. And she, she lived in Valdosta, which is 15 minutes outside of Quitman. So she stayed in South Georgia. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. But Spence, man, he was good looking. I'm like, damn, he should have procreated. He should have made some babies. And often. He was, yeah. He was a really good looking man. Like he got a lot of the love. I mean, bless that must've been so frustrating for Millie, Millie and Louise to have a brother that was like really stinking good looking. <laughs> <laughs> to be the women of the family. <laughs> and then and all, the, all their friends are like, what's Spence doing? And they're they say, shut up. Shut I don't want to hear it. Friends. I'm going to talk to Spence. I mean, Paul was good looking too, but Spence just had a certain je ne sais quoi. Like, Spence had a certain like, which I looked, I mean, the minute I saw his picture, I was like, oh yeah, he was totally gay. <laughs> I was like, Paul, when you look at pictures of Paul, when he, my, my great grandfather, when he was young, he was like straight good looking. But Spence, Spence was, was hot. Like, he was hot. He was hot. And he, he, and he, but he and Paul had a great relationship. I mean, they were very close as brothers. And that's how my father knew his great uncles because he, again, again, Spence died in 1980. My father was born in like 57. So he spent a lot of time with Spence too as he got older. I don't, I haven't seen pictures of Spence as, as an old man. I've only seen the pictures of him in his young and days. I haven't either. And that's the thing. It's like he kind of just dropped off as he, hit a certain age and it was probably like middle age you don't hear anything about spence after he after he was president of the country club no more about spence he just lived his gay fabulous life with his beard wife and right which makes you wonder did Very he quiet. establish himself in society and then 
he creeped. Probably. Probably. And I don't, and now I wonder like, what did Paul know? What did, did Paul cover for him? Like, what did Paul know? Especially after Stanley died, their father died. Like what did Paul Because know? literally there's all these details about the sisters all the way through their lives, everything that they did and the brothers radio silence. I'm going to have to send this to my aunts and see, and even my mom, my mom, my mom actually, it surprises me sometimes when my mom knows about my dad's family. Cause she'll say stuff sometimes um, about my dad's family. But again, my mother came from a prominent family. She married my dad who came from a prominent family. So boom, they know about each other's families. Um, and, but you know, it's interesting though, Bobby, my grandmother for, for the, for the affluent lifestyle that she came from, she worked really hard her whole life and she never, Never. I never saw her treat anybody without respect. I never saw her flaunt. I will have to say that about her. Like, and of course she had big diamonds and she had pretty jewelry and she always dressed nicely. Went to the beauty parlor once a week. Cause that's what they did. Got her hair set once a week. Um, I wonder if she, she went to see Spence's wife. I mean, well, <laughs> maybe that's how she <laughs> I want to know more about Spence's wife. Like, girl, were you a lesbian too? Is that how this worked? Like, I don't know what's going on here. Like, I would not be happy being in a sexless, sexless marriage like that. You know, especially if your husband's that freaking hot. Right? You know? So, I want to know her story. But, yeah, I mean, my grandmother was very, she was very um, humble, very, very virtuous in a lot of ways. Very, she was a, my, her and my grandfather both were just very good people very very good people um and and it's 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 amazing that she grew up with such power and and privilege that she ended up being such a hard worker herself and just just a really good person everyone loved her every time you came to what can i get for you that's what she would say every time you came to her house what can i get for you what can i get for you and when we would go, I remember when we would have dinner at their house sometimes, like after my mom's parents died. So they were my only grandparents. <laughs> my mom would get mad at my dad a lot because anytime my dad wanted something or anybody wanted something, my grandmother would get up from the table and go get it. And I remember my mom yelling at my dad in the car and be like, you need to actually get up and get stuff for your mother. Like you don't need your, your mother does not need to be getting up and getting people stuff. You need to be the one to get up and get your mother stuff. Because she was always just trying to make sure everyone was okay um, with her iced tea, her South her South Georgia iced tea that she put pineapple juice in, a very specific form of iced tea, sweet tea. It had pineapple and drop biscuits and, you know. So I remember I asked her Bobby once, um, right when she got Alzheimer's, so I, I made sure, and I have it on video somewhere where I asked her because she tried to teach me how to meditate when I was like eight years old. And I remember that. This was before meditation was and yoga was a, a thing. Nobody knew what that was. This is the 90s. And I asked my grandmother, I just got back from my first trip to India. And I was like, Grandma, I remember you trying to teach me how to meditate when I was a kid. And I was like, how did you discover meditation? I was like, how did you, growing up in South Georgia, discover this? This wasn't a thing back then. And she goes, you know, it was so damn hot in South Georgia growing up. I think all we could do was just sit, sit and stare. <laughs> All we could do was just sit and stare. I think that's how I found meditation. <laughs> Bless her. So, it was so damn hot down there. Um, yeah. she And I remember her one time, she was very supportive of, well, that's interesting now that I think back. She was very supportive of gay rights, even though she was a Republican. She was very supportive of gay rights. Um, and now I wonder why. What did she know that she didn't tell us? She told me once that um, there was a little boy. She remembers when she was a, a young little girl that this little boy would come over and play with her and her sister. And this little boy loved playing dolls with her and her sister. And now she wonders. But I'm like, did you know about your aunts? Well, obviously, you knew, you suspected your aunts. But did you also know about your uncle? Because I never, I never heard her talk about Spencer. Only my dad talked about Spencer. So, Yeah. D different times we're so we're, in a lot of ways we're, we're 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 not lucky living when we live now but in a lot of ways we are because a lot of these insecurities they had are just not a problem i mean what do you think stanley would think of me bobby with all my my tattoos and living with a boy and oh that whole living with a man thing and my, 
he's got a sleeve of tat. My my boyfriend's covered in tattoos. Like I don't even know what his, some of his skin looks like because he's got so many tattoos. So he might say to him what my mother said to me when I got my first one. Well, at least we can identify your body in the morgue when we find you dead. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother knew I had him. My grandmother knew. She didn't care. She knew my nose, nose, nose was pierced. They, she knew I'm pier I used to have piercings all up my ear. You know, again, I think that was probably her spirit coming through. She probably wished she could have done that. Um, but she she did a lot. She was she wore pantsuits, but I always say Hillary Clinton in pantsuit nation. That was my grandmother. I will tell you a real funny story, though. I don't know if I've told you this, Bobby. So in the South, we take our religion real serious. Whether you're a Protestant or a Catholic, it's a very big deal. Between Protestant and Catholic, bigger deal at that point, bigger deal than Republican or Democrat. And the Bennetts were Democrats. They were Dixie Democrats. Um, and my grandmother, when she first came up to Shorter College, she started dating a Democrat who was a Catholic. Well, my great-granddaddy Paul had a huge problem with that huge problem with him being a catholic that really was my I, I remember my grandmother talking about that there that, that was a huge deal my grandfather was not happy about him being a catholic there was a lot of tension because of her dating according this man as they called it back then mm -hmm. well my grandfather what the watson my granddad he was in the military at the time he was about five or six years older than my grandmother and he came through a house party they were they were kind of stationed in the area and there was a house party and he went to the house party. My grandmother was playing the piano at the house party for the for the entertainment. And he said to his buddy in the military, I'm going to marry that woman one day. And that's how he met my grandmother. Well, at that time, this was scandal because she was dating the Catholic boy at that time. They were mm -hmm. heavy courting. And my grandfather came in and basically really like pursued my grandmother, even though she was a men just don't do that anymore, do they? They don't, they don't fight for women anymore. He they pursued don't. her and pursued her and but he would not give up. He would not give up with my grandmother. And finally she dumped the Catholic boy to date my granddad, but brought my granddad down to equipment to meet her family. And my granddad was a big Republican, but he was a Protestant. And my granddaddy Paul, my great granddaddy Paul was just so relieved that he was a Protestant. He did not care that my grandfather was a Republican. He was just glad that he was a Protestant. So it was just different times back then, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. It was. You're right, because religion was huge. And now you look, think about it. Think about big great granddaddy Billy, the Baptist minister. Yep. That had to have been playing a key factor in it. Of uh, we come from the Baptist. We're you Protestant. can't be marrying a Catholic. Yeah, and, and well, that makes sense too, because if they were Huguenots originally coming up from New Orleans and had to flee quickly to get to English territory where they could be mm -hmm. safe, it was Protestant. That the trauma, last thing you want is a Catholic. Yeah, is a Catholic. That trauma would have stayed in their in their mm -hmm. psyche. And um, and so yeah, it's and it's interesting. <laughs> I just well, I read too somewhere that Paul, my grandfather Paul and his wife May Beck went to two different churches but they were both protestants so they both went to two but they, like that's she, not unusual because my great grandparents did the same thing yeah she was like a methodist and so and and i think i actually read it in my great aunt jane's obituary where she would go to different churches because she went to her at church and he went but at least they were both protestant that was the important thing is that they were both protestant um wild wild yeah. should i talk about the hauntings do it so the big house you were talking about, I think, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, if you're from Quitman, Georgia, I'll tag Quitman in this. I think it's a flower shop now. I might be mistaken. I definitely want to stop there at some point or just take a trip down there. It's only like three hours, four hours from Atlanta. Um, and it's haunted apparently by Stanley. Seems Stanley lived such a good life in Quitman, he don't want to leave. And I thought that was so bizarre and there were also stories about paul potentially haunting some land equipment i don't think paul's haunting anything to be honest i i think paul's too nice yeah and i think paul i i i think paul would have been one that would want to move on just move on yeah he wanted to be and i and you might be right too because Maybach, his first wife he did remarry my grandmother hated her stepmother she would tell me because my dad married a woman and that's part of the reason why my dad abandoned us is because of his his second wife, which is 
she's been atrocious. And my grandmother was very well aware of the situation. And especially when she got Alzheimer's, she would use the C word a lot in reference to my stepmother, which was hysterical because I didn't even know she knew curse words and she was dropping that C word. I mean, it was awesome. But she told me one time um, that when her father remarried his second, that her and her sister did not like their stepmother because their stepmother was really nasty to them. Now, here's the thing. The second wife married and married Paul Bennett. There was a lot of money there. And on top of that, there was a huge dairy farm, a lot of property. And my step, my mother said that she used to, my stepmother, my step grandmother, great grandmother, her stepmother hated fake flowers. So my grandmother <laughs> would constantly place orders for fake flowers to be delivered. And because it was Paul's daughter, she had to keep them displayed. So my grandmother, Marianne, was petty. <laughs> and she told me that flat out. She was like, she's like, tee hee hee. <laughs> and she said when Paul died, when my grandfather died, they were, my great grandfather died. They were, her and her sister were very stressed about the will because they were worried that their stepmother had weaseled her way into collecting everything and cutting Jane and my grandmother out. And that was not the case. When they read the will, my grand my grandfather left like nothing to his second wife. Everything was left to my, my grandmother and her sister. I don't think the thing, same can be said with my dad. To be honest with you, I don't think that's going to happen with my dad. I think my dad doesn't even remember he has children at this point um, or grandchildren, which is sad for him. But, um, you know, but but for Paul, his daughters were very important to him that that they were taken care of in his will. And so, um, yeah, I think and I think it just his his first wife, I think Maybach was his love. And the fact that she died early, I think he was excited to, to be with her and to be back with Maybach. Uh, my grandmother used to have I don't even know who has it now, but upstairs in our house, she had this beautiful picture painting, oil painting of Maybach, my great grandmother with my grandmother and her sister when they were little girls. It was this beautiful like oil painting of her with her daughters. So, um, so yeah, it's uh Marianne could be a little, well, that's what I liked about her. She was as sweet as pie. She would fix you that sweet tea. Can I get you something? But you piss her off. She'll send you some fake flowers. <laughs> Which makes me more thinking it was her as opposed to him that might be haunting the place. Honestly. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, I don't know. I was looking at Quitman's map because I found, I don't even know. Like if I were to go to Quitman, and Quitman's a tiny town, I might could just find the farm, dairy farm just on my own, but I don't even know where it is, equipment. I don't, you know, I, I don't really have, I mean, I guess I could, could ask my mom. She might remember, but I don't, you know, I don't have contact with my dad. So, but I, I think from what I read, I think they sold the dairy farm to another dairy company that actually still runs it as a dairy farm. Um, and, that but the house that's that Stanley built, that Stanley's house is haunted by Stanley. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that was gnarly, Bobby, when you realize your ancestor is haunting a place, like a recent ancestor, that's kind of gnarly to read those stories. Yeah. I, I'm like, do I have a karmic duty to, to go, go talk, talk to Stanley? To talk to Stanley. Be like, brah, brah. Look, yo, brah. <laughs> but supposedly there's quite a few places that Stanley might be haunting in Quitman. I'll, 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 I'll find them all. I'll just go talk to you like grandpappy. Because there's a there's a creepy old bridge in Quitman. And then there's that cabin in Quitman. Yeah, I saw that. On, there's a, like a Paul, uh, there's a Paul Bennett. What was it? There's some land that's named after Paul Bennett. Right. Like a marshland. Right. In South Georgia. But that was all that was all Stanley's land at one point. Which I wonder if he maybe sectioned it off to the kids. Probably. And that was maybe that was Paul's cabin on Stanley's land. Probably. I want to go down there. I really do. I, I, I need to reach out to the Chamber of Commerce and just be like. Well, if you reach out to Chamber of Commerce, you tell them that you're Louise's niece. Great, great niece, because, you know, she was on the chamber. Ah, uh, that's a good idea. I will. I'll say I, because I, I, I was thinking I could just say I'm Stanley Bennett's great, great, great granddaughter, but no, Louise right. Bennett. Or you tell him you're great, Williams, great, 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 great granddaughter. The founder. Founder. Yeah, that I'm through Marianne Bennett, um, who became Watson. 
I'm through her. She's my grandmother. I wonder, and I've even thought about that. See, that's the thing. Like, that's what's so sad. I was really close to my dad's parents, but I'm not close to my cousins. I don't have any contact info. I know my cousins, but I don't have their phone numbers. I don't, that's what's so weird. Like my mom's family, I, my cousins are like my siblings. It's but, not yeah. weird, Bryce. Honestly, it's not weird because there are so many families where you will realize and discover that you have family that you don't know about. I'm learning about cousins that I didn't realize that I even had as I'm doing more genealogy research. So don't feel like you should be closer to anybody in your family that you don't know about. It's strange. Well, and I often blame it on my father. And I don't, again, I don't know what I, I, I've gotten to a point in my life where I can realize my father never loved us. Like I can say that comfortably now. Like I understand that he just did not have the capacity to love his children. I totally get that. He has the capacity to love his stepchildren, but he does not have the capacity to love his own children. And, and that's been a huge tr therapy thing I've had to go through with, with the daddy issues. And I've been able, you know, as I like to say, two things can be true. I can have a really bad dad, but also really great grandparents. And I was really close to my grandparents. And I and the two things can remain true that I am okay with the fact that I don't have a dad. I'm I'm totally made I made I've made peace with the fact that I actually don't have a dad. That I I have a sperm donor. I had someone that's biologically my father, but I did not have a father as far as the emotional sense of the the support system of a of a male. And I think too, Bobby, what my my father even when I was a little child, I remember being um, keenly aware that my dad was very upset he did not have a son, that we were not, that he had all, that he was a girl dad. And it's interesting because I used to say that I'm glad I didn't have a brother, even though I always wanted a brother, I'm glad I didn't have a brother because if my brother had been gay or effeminate, I don't think my father would have been able to handle that. And that's interesting looking at his family now. Um, now, with my dad's family, as a child, I always felt like my dad prioritized, even though I didn't know the word prioritize, I felt like his sisters and their kids and his parents always took precedence over my sister and me. Mm. I, as a child, that was how I felt. My, nep my nephews, my male cousins and my female cousin were more important to my father than my sister and me were. His sisters were way more important to him than his children. And he made us feel like we were a burden to my grandparents. Hmm. And I actually remember that, that specifically being said to my sister and me. Hmm. And I don't know why, now looking back through with, with my therapist, I do understand that that was abuse. I do get that. And that was not how i know that's not how my aunts see us and i know that's not how my grand unfortunately i don't have a relationship with my aunts i wish i did and there's also a different dynamic right i think there is a different dynamic between a father and a mother like the mother's family like a mother's sister so my my mother's sisters are closer to biologically genetically are closer to my mom right so so there is going to be a different genetic connection biological connection i think like my nephew and nieces i'm their mother's sister so there's a different relationship that I, that I have with my nephew and nieces than my brother-in-law's siblings because mm -hmm. it's your mom's sister, right? So the, you're the next best. I'm the next best thing to their mother, is right. Me, right? So, and with your father, you know, your father's sisters. I think there is a bit of a different relationship anyway, just a dynamic anyway. But um, and so I don't really have contact with my with my aunts or my cousins at all. And and it's not no fault to them. They're really great people. I wish I knew my male cousins better because I follow them on Instagram and they're one of them is hysterical. Like he posts the funniest shit. You know, he's so funny. And I'm always like, oh he's so funny. But I don't even know their birthdays. Like I don't even know their birthdays, you know? But my mom my so yeah, it's it's um and hopefully if I can share this video, maybe this will bring us closer together. Maybe we can all go down there as the next generation. I can get them to come down with me to Quitman and and see everything with me since they're you'll have the first annual reunion of this generation this generation i can't be the only one with tattoos i don't know if they have tattoos but i would i would not be surprised if they've got some tattoos too so yeah it's um it's it's interesting and it's um yeah and then you know they didn't grow up with us i will say too they did not they did not live around us so maybe that's it as well as they lived in different parts of the world and the country and you know it's um 
but it's a shame. I, I look at my, my, I don't understand, you know, I look at my nephew and my nieces and I think what a shame that my father's missing out on his actual grandchildren because they're really cool kids. And, you know, so that's his loss. It's his loss. And my grandmother would say all the time and my grandmother got to know she, she met my, my nephew and my oldest niece, Charlie and Jacqueline, and she got to hold May, the new May's two now and May was before she passed away. And she would say uh, she loved being a great grandmother. She would say all the time when she was putting the the, all, the old people home when she when she needed constant help because of her Alzheimer's. She would walk around tell the nurses all the time when they would come visit. These are the kids that made me great because she was a great grandmother. So she's like, these were the kids that made me great. I wasn't great until they were born. And she was so proud of these. Of, so you know, I'm so glad she got to witness like the next generation. She, the, you know, she with May, she would get confused with May because that's when May was born. She would hold May and be like, now whose baby is this again? Because she, you know, her mind was, my sister would be like, grandmother, that's, that's my baby. That's May. That's your great, great granddaughter. You know, that's your great granddaughter, May. And now, whose baby is this again? And she'd be like, so, um, you know, so it's just, and that's cool too. You think about all the way back to old Billy, Peepaw, Billy, the Peepaw, I love Peepaw. it. People, he's got, and, and you look at my nephew and how many, and how cool that is to see just the generations, the, the flow of time and how if somebody didn't marry somebody, if my grandfather wasn't eager beaver and broke up my grand, or, or if that high tower, the coroner didn't, many didn't meet Stanley, you know, it's, it's, it's just interesting how, I think that's why people love genealogy so much. It's just mm -hmm. these little, these little choices people make that domino effect and change everything for all of us that one split decision yeah. that changes everything trajectory of life honestly i say that about us americans and mm -hmm. i think that's true for the australians and the south africans and the canadians if i i've said that a lot one of the most fascinating thing about being an american is if somebody didn't get on the boat when he or she did if somebody did not make that decision a really big decision i wouldn't be here today Bobby wouldn't be here today if one of her ancestors didn't get on the boat when they did. They missed that boat or decided at the last minute not to take the chance. So it's fascinating. Definitely, no, definitely no lack of fear yeah, when right. it comes to it, honestly. Very courageous. Um, and and Bobby, this has been, I thank you so much. I cannot wait. If you guys want to see, I, I I hope this was fun for you guys to get to see the scan. We all have scandals, guys. Don't we, Bobby? Everybody's got scandals. Don't Nobody's we? innocent. Nobody. Nobody. And I see so many <laughs> people get all upset when they find out a YouTuber has family in the Freemasons. It's like, have you checked? Have you looked in your backyard? Bet you you got some too. Right. Like, no. And, and that's what's so fun is we get to read these scandals and speculate what their lives were like. And um, if you guys want to hear part two about old Billy, old Billy, people, <laughs> you people said, Billy, he had kind of a kind of a, a interesting life. You know, when people don't have TV to distract them, they get up to some mischief, don't they? They, they get bored. Start. They get they bored. They do something. Yeah, and that's they what add on another do. job, or they take on a scandal. I mean, it's one of the two things. Have a mistress, you know. All of a sudden, you're doing twenty three and me, and you find cousins you really didn't know existed. They join the Masons, hook up with the clan. I mean, you, you got to do something with your dad. time. You get on a boat and go to France, <laughs> you know, like um. So. Guys, if you want to know more about my family scandal, let us know. We'll do something old, old Peepaw Billy. I know that I'm going to be connecting Bobby with Catherine as well. So that nothing about like like being an open book for your audience, Bobby, and being like, here's my family secrets. <laughs> so, so, um, and Bobby, you eventually want to offer this service for people as well. Is there an email address that people can contact you um, if they want you to do like a private do a business with you and, and, and do a private research into their genealogy? Yes. Crazy grave lady at gmail.com. And I know you're going to put that link in your description box too, but yeah, crazy grave lady gmail.com. Let me know if you would like me to talk about the dirt in your family. Let me know. We all have that one corner of our family. We're like, What's Dust that? It out. What's that about <laughs> who, who that person? I found some Hatties in my family. I was like, now we've got some really cool names in this. I think the Bennett's had some actually really cool names. And I'm like, and you picked Bryce? I could have been a Hattie. I could have been a Minnie. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> I could have been a Millie. Um, so anyway, guys, well, thank you, Bobby. This was so much fun. And I know I'm going to tease it for our audience. You're working on a really big story right now for your channel. That's kind of part of our American history, kind of a, a more macabre part of our American history. And I know Bobby's working hard on it and I, I won't say any more, guys. So make sure you're subscribed to Bobby's channel. Hit the notification bell. So when those episodes do drop on her channel, you'll be the first in line to see what scandalous information she's found out about people who are not. Well, you're kind of connected to the case, but you're not related to the actual subject of the case. Mm -hmm. Just uh, part of the uh, more American macabre history so all right you guys well we hope you have a wonderful day and we will talk to you all soon bye everybody